for tuning in to part two of 7.3 oceans. Let's take a look at marine biomes. Start you off with the question, which of the following marine ecosystems are known for high biodiversity? It says multiple mark. So go ahead and pause. All right, welcome back. Did you say intertidal regions? Probably number one there on biodiversity. But we also have estuaries and marshes, which are considered ecotone areas, where you have the freshwater and the saltwater ecosystems coming together, and you have a la large variety of, um, of biology, biodiversity. Coral reefs, of course, providing habitat for many different varieties of species. And kelp forests, you could say a similar thing. It's a great, great habitat for lots of different species, sea urchins, um, various crabs, fish sea otters, etc. The, uh, the ones that are definitely not known for biodiversity would be open ocean. There's not a whole lot of activity going out there. Things are a little bit boring because you're not near coastal waters. There aren't as many nutrients available. Uh, also the deep ocean, uh, strange place, but not a lot of biodiversity, at least not that we know of. They haven't been explored to much depth yet. That was not a joke. All right, so open ocean, some characteristics here are that surface waters are variable in their biology. Many areas are scarce in life, but areas like nutrient-rich upwellings teem with life. But we generally find those closer to the coast, not what we would call the open ocean. And plankton shown here are the base of the oceanic food chain. The deep abyssal ocean are devoid of sunlight, so ecosystems cannot rely on plant growth. Animals here, few and far between, scavenge detritus, dead organisms from above or prey on each other, or have symbiotic microbes that produce food for them. And this anglerfish is one of many bizarre-looking deep-sea creatures. The luminescent projection on its forehead attracts curious fish which it eats. Kelp forest, you know, kelp is actually an algae, even though we think of it as a plant. It's a large brown algae, or often called seaweed, and it goes up to 60, 60 meters, or 200 feet tall from the continental shelves. It creates forests that harbor and feed many other organisms. And here we have coral reefs. So some significant things are that corals are, it's actually from living organisms, they are tiny invertebrate animals. Remember, invertebrate means that its, its structure, its vertebrate, is on the outside. Whereas we, us, we are vertebrates. So they are, um, those, they are, we have our vertebrate on the inside. Um, I mean, inner skeleton, invertebrate has outer skeleton. Okay, so what about them? They occur in large numbers together. As they die, their skeletons build coral reefs out of calcium carbonate. And reefs provide habitat and food for many other animals and are a key ecosystem for biodiversity. Um, okay, let's go to the next part here. They also help protect coasts by absorbing wave energy. And here we see partially bleached coral. Bleaching occurs when the algae components die. And we see really colorful coral. That's from the different colored algae that lives in like a symbiotic relationship with some of the other things that we're talking about. Um, there's little things called polyps, and those are the invertebrate animals. Intertidal, intertidal zones, like uh, what we see along the beaches here or at UCSB by the Marine Science Institute, they um, they occur generally along rocky beaches where you actually have um, little tide pools that can form. And the tides cover organisms most of the day and leave them exposed to air or bathe in tide pools part of the day. So it's really a really interesting ecosystem because you have, to have, you have creatures who need to be able to survive being submersed in water for half the day and then exposed to air for half the day or, or a quarter of the day. So very high biodiversity here. We got starfish, crabs, sea urchins, and algae. And um, as we said, they must endure extreme fluctuating conditions. Intertidal organisms, they can adapt to certain levels according to how much wave action and coverage by water they prefer. And uh, again, leading to high biodiversity. So even within these intertidal zones, we have different levels. We have some zones that are generally more often um, uh, underwater and other areas that are more often exposed to air. You can see these mussels along here. So even just within the span of a few meters, you actually have quite a diversity of, um, of conditions. And salt marshes, they cover intertidal, intertidal areas with sandy or silty substrate and temperate regions. 
tides flow into and out of channels called tidal creeks flanked with mostly grasses. You see this a lot in Florida. I used to live in Pensacola, Florida, or at least my parents did. I go visit them during college. And uh, you would drive by just miles and miles of this stuff. And it would actually smell kind of like, you could smell the methane, the natural gas being given off from the anaerobic bacteria in some of the stagnant water. And we have estuaries. This is our local estuary at Arroyo Borough, Hendry's Beach. And these places are known for having, um, well, it, by definition, they are areas where rivers flow into the ocean and mix fresh with salt water, um, mix fresh water with salt water. And uh, many salt marshes and mangrove forests occur here. The biological, they are very productive. There's lots of nutrients, lots of fish, lots of birds, lots of invertebrates. Mangrove forests, we see these often in Florida. They're in tropical and subtropical regions, sandy and silty beaches. They, they host forest of mangroves, which are bushy trees adapted to salt water. And they're important for habitat because many animals find homes among the root networks. And these forests are often lost to human development. They provide an important environmental service of coastal protection from tropical storms as they absorb the force of strong winds and tidal surges. It is said that the, the um, the intensity of Hurricane Katrina, one of our worst hurricanes ever, would have been drastically um, improved if we had not removed as many mangrove forests as we had. Because they're tall, they break up wind, they have roots that go down so they can protect, um, they can break up the water um, as it's rushing in. And, um, and they have pretty strong roots so they can help prevent erosion. All right, quiz some time. How do each of the following marine ecosystems help protect coastlines from tidal storm energy? Actually, this one's not a Quizdom one, so I want you to be able to describe how each of those three help protect coastlines. So go ahead and pause and take some notes on this in your assignment 7.3. I forget what number it is, but you'll see it. All right, let's move on to ocean pollution. Actually, I'm going to stop here, pause, and um, pick up.